Live from the Mission Bay Conference Center in San Francisco, California, it's The Cube at Google Cloud Platform Live. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Frick. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are live in San Francisco. This is theCUBE, extracting the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. Join with my co-host, Jeff Frick. Our next guest is Brian Stevens, Vice President of Google's Cloud Platform, former CUBE alumni, uh, mm -hmm. legend at Red Hat for many, many years, uh, industry legend. Brian, welcome to theCUBE again. Thank you very much. That's, that's <laughs> a, a good intro, right? Hey, so, um, my kids would be proud. Yeah, they'd be proud. <laughs> yeah. So we just talked with Craig McLaughlin, product manager, named Kubernetes, just totally geek talk. But the big thing we talked about was we're kind of seeing the old centralized mainframe cloud similarities where systems program and operating systems, the, the revolution in Unix, Linux, kernels, the old major innovation engine of of systems, operating systems, you know, in the client server, in these large systems, now becoming completely decentralized in an empowering way. So, uh, you know, you've been there, you worked at DEC, probably had the biggest OS, and I think the biggest network at the time with DECnet, Red Hat, obviously, you know, made an industry. Um, you guys have a really interesting view here. So, is are we going into this next generation of a completely federated, un organically growing operating system? You know, I think it, I mean, it. That's a good way to put it. I mean, I guess it is the operating system of the cloud, right? Um, but the, um, you know, I think it's the roots of sort of building reliable enterprise grade distributed systems, which we all knew was important, you know, but the, it was a different model when you had to hand a pile of software to somebody, right? And so now all of a sudden, you know, it's making everybody rethink it when you're actually running infrastructure as a service, right? So it is, a, it is absolutely a new day and I think the, you know, to date, we haven't even scratched the surface of necessarily even understanding what that should look like. More, you know, less so around how somebody should use it. So, I published last night a market share study by TBR that Google's got one percent, and hey, you know, you could double market share next year by That's going right. to two percent. That in one to two percent, kind of like a. But so, I mean, relatively small relative to the, uh, you know, Amazon and the public cloud. But that there's a bigger game going on here. So I want you to tease out for the folks watching about the Google opportunity in the cloud to understand. You guys had a clean sheet of paper, you have a clean sheet of paper vis-a-vis, -vis, say, Amazon, right. who has legacy now, um, certainly winning uh, with market share. And what do you, so what, yeah. is the, what is the purpose of Google? We see yeah. you making moves. Is there a strategy that you can articulate and help people understand the, the play, the Google angle on the market? I think a, I think a big part about it is, is today it has largely been about CapEx, right? And so the public cloud is a great service in its current form. But it's largely about, you know, where do I put that virtual machine, right? And so that's what we talk about. I mean, the number one service that we think about is for hosting virtual machines. And I think that that's, um, while that's interesting, you know, that's sort of the race to the bottom, like on how cheap is hardware and managing hardware. The real, the real value that we've seen is just really getting started is, this, is how do you actually allow a developer to build an application that can store data, analyze data at a rate, and machine learning as an example, and pull insight back um, at cloud scale. And I think then when you actually start to do that, then it actually starts to change the types of applications that are being built. That really changes an industry, I think. You know, right now we're really in around where we run workload. And to me, that's probably a slight improvement on hosters. Right, but that only gets what you know. We've certainly signed up. And, and essentially, now the model is not just a big chunk of software that you'd hand the customer. Also, it's not about one vendor anymore. You got open source is now a level leveler in terms of the, the power. Um, so I got to ask you: Are the platform strategies and execution different? The old day was lock in, win the platform, yeah. and monetize the hell out of it. Yeah. Now it seems to be the tooling is the way to go. And if you look at Amazon, how they handle their retail business, almost a direct mirror yeah. to how they handle yeah. their cloud, which is give away, burn the village, win the platform yeah. by pure zero cost, right. and then tool up and packaging. So you're seeing that similar trend. Are you guys looking at it that way? Well, is I, tooling important? Absolutely. Well, I think it's it's the it's the mantra that you believe in that's really important. Right? When you think about like, you know, enterprise IT are smart. They've been trapped before, right? And they know that the investments that they make, they want to be able to move forward 
maybe revisit those down the road. And I think that if, you, if you're if you not really fully committed to an all-in open platform, then I think you don't have a very strong value proposition in winning the next generation of workload. And that's why, you know, you've, you've seen us publish a lot of APIs and whatnot as open source. You know, the differentiation is in the service, right? It's not in the code itself, right? And so I think, you know, you'll continue to see us to realize that open frameworks, open source is really where it's at from a developer perspective. We're just going to embrace that really hard. Yeah, a lot of people didn't predict Red Hat for being a, a viable business model. You were there for many, many years, over a decade. So Google has that same approach, not directly, you know, overlaid to Red Hat, but similar, right? Be open, but yeah. bi build value. What Red Hat's done, it's interesting, is they built a multi over a decade SLA into the into the software, it's open source. I mean, customers like that. I mean, that's not, that's value add. Yeah. So how, you guys see Google Club being the same way where you push stuff out there, make the tooling free, add value on top? Well, you know, I mean, the, 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 the Red Hat model was, you know, just such a huge value from from the current environment of IT. Right? The current environment was super expensive, didn't work that well, didn't perform that well, because when you think about it, vendors, once they win an entrenched position, it's all about growth for them. So it's what's the next thing they can do, and they don't usually reinvest back in the old thing that they did that you're already trapped on. So Red Hat absolutely took advantage of that by presenting a different model. I think the, the, the corollary to that, or the parallel to that rather, is that we too are looking at like not how you can do the same thing differently or run it somewhere else. We're looking at it and saying, "Wow, look at the scale of the Google Cloud. Look at this. Look at the look at the network that we've laid down that spans world global. If we can actually expose that and allow customers to actually use that infrastructure and use those services, what can they do on top of that platform that they've never done before?" And so that's sort of the the model and reliability and, too. You and, have to nail the reliability issue. So. What I found interesting was the interconnect announcement today, which is very interesting. You kind of, we were calling it on the intro, the Netflix problem. Everyone knows yeah. Netflix, and you know the service providers can throttle. They can certainly do deep packet inspection. Oh, well, so could Google, but there's a trust there. If you yeah. can connect peering relationships with companies, they can avoid yeah. potentially that risk. Is that? Yeah. Well, that you know, I mean, it, we are even doing our 2015 planning right now, and the, you know the. The two top requirements that we have for all the cloud platform are reliability and user experience. So when you think about it, it's not about like bring out the next feature and how quickly you get the next feature out. It's really reliability is the bedrock. And so we see that, I mean you see that from search, it's in the core of the company. You know, if Google search is down, you know, a lot of the world is down in terms of the capability that they have, right? And so we see too from a cloud platform perspective that increasingly you're going to be running critical workloads on there. It's someone else's business. Be down. It's, it's someone else's business. And so it and, and, and it's your brand. So it's it, it you know the the day starts and stops reliability and everything else on it is gravy. So it's it's interesting, Brian. You say reliability and user experience, but you guys are beholden now that everything is not mobile. Uh, come along, but mobile first, really. To, to, to the carrier networks and stuff sure. that's really outside of your control that, as we had an earlier guest said, you got a 75 millisecond um, hump just to get from the phone to the tower. So, I mean, right. how are you guys addressing that? Is yeah. that part of your strategy in yeah. terms of those two priorities? I'm sure there's probably other parts of Google that are working on, <laughs> on, on how to get better mobile connectivity because they too suffer it even in their consumer lives as well right, on, right. on the, where the mobile network is. And so I don't think, you know, that necessarily, you know, those that's sort of a level playing field for everybody. Right. I think okay. that part of it, you know, um, but but what it is is a realization is on our part is that today if an application or a service is built and it doesn't have a mobile way of accessing it, then it almost doesn't matter that it exists. And I think that that's sort of the that's sort of a new model for enterprise IT when you think about it. In the consumer space, they got that. Right. But in enterprise IT, in many cases, they're still building their old internal services and applications without you know, a handheld, a handheld right? Device. And so part of what we're doing is actually just trying to provide, extend the reach, you know, of mobile applications to, you know, segments that traditionally are still writing web scale apps. Yeah. The other thing I want to follow up on your keynote, which I thought was interesting, you know, you, you outlined some major shift points, some major uh, trends, x86, Linux, virtualization, and then public cloud. And then you basically stated that now this containerization is as big as the shift as those other five. So I, I don't know if people really understand yeah. that that is adding a whole nother yeah. layer to what they a lot of people probably still perceive as really just kind of the cloud piece. Yeah. You know what's funny is though, each one of those shifts that started 15 years ago is 
15 years ago, they all build on each other. So when we look at like sort of our cloud platform, for example, it's building on x86 and Linux. Right. Next to layer up, it took advantage of virtualization, built a public cloud, and now today we announced that we're embracing containers. So, so in many ways, disruptions aren't things that like, you know, take all existing technology and move them out. But rather, if you don't take advantage of the disruption, then you're probably not going to be relevant or offering you know the opportunity that you could be. And so the the container paradigm is interesting because it's for the first time we're looking at models where you know we can actually deploy lightweight applications that are portable. And that's been the bane of IT's existence for years. If you ever spent if you ever really spend your time with in an IT department, you know, myself as a vendor, I've never had to live that on a daily basis, but I spend enough time with them know that, you know, they live in a world of pain, right? That eight percent of the time they're doing the unglorious things, you know, where they're just rolling out new versions of software for no incremental value, it takes them six months to do it, you know, and it, it's hard for them to really get to the real meat of things they need for their business. So containers is probably, you know, cloud is one thing, I mean, that's gonna help them a lot. But then the container aspect of that is really going to change that process um, from a testability and reliability perspective. And, and seeing them embrace it, they're actually enterprises before there are even products around. They're embracing the whole container technology movement, and they're already re retooling all their own internal apps. With that in mind, yeah. So there's mind. a lot of commentary um, on the containers. Want to just get your thoughts on? So then I want to pivot into how you guys going to get into the enterprise. Some are saying it's going to be a tough haul for you guys to get in there without winning the developers first, which it's pretty clear you're already going doing that. You're yeah. going after to, or going to the developers to bring them the Google goodness, the goody basket from, the, <laughs> from your cloud, as well as uh, solving the scale problem. But the question here is, timing of the containers is perfect for this marketplace. It eliminates a lot of the needs for cross-vendor cloud slash infrastructure with common management capabilities layered in. Do you agree with that statement? Yeah, that yeah. it's a cross-vendor cloud kind I, of play. I do. I mean, I think that you know all underlying platforms aren't created equal, and every application that you find inside of a container, you know, doesn't necessarily get the you know good housekeeping seal of approval on it, right? So there's still you know certification and value they have to do to understand the two parts. But the reality is that yeah, the application and the operating system have been far too married together for too long, and that's been really part of what has been the bane of IT is, is managing that. So, so containers is the first time that there's been technology that's helping with an operational problem in, in quite some time. So the other comment from Mark Field that says, containers also offer much reduced overhead, improving server CPU utilization and performance. Right. Is that, that a small nuance? Is no, that, that is true, and that's that's when you look at sort of like when we talk about that Google runs a container architecture internally for yeah. years, that's a non-virtualized environment. Okay. So every app that's provisioned on any piece of infrastructure happens dynamically in a container without virtualization. Super lightweight. You know, the, the but this doesn't make virtualization dead, it means virtualization's a part of the architecture. It's built so in native. It's built in. So like our the cloud platform is based on virtualization underneath containers. And that's really valuable because it, it, what it, it does is it allows us to service the underlying infrastructure. So, you know, if we need to service hardware or if we need to service the underlying operating system, we just live migrate our customers' workload across. So you see the virtualization the being the adaptive fabric. They can be, it's a, it's a huge part of the maintainability of the underlying platform. Absolutely. Okay, so IT, you guys, what's your plans with IT? I mean, obviously, Google's pretty well thought out, pretty, pretty you know, they, they don't just go shotgun, they pretty much take a targeted approach to winning. And I, and I want to try to nail that with you here. Is containers <laughs> your way to backdoor into the enterprise, or hey, that's a bad one, I should say. Well, you know, because it's a, it's a heavy lift to win the enterprise, or yeah. get in there and compete. Yeah. Uh, you got a lot of leverage, you got a lot of muscle, certainly. Yeah. You guys have been doing containers for a long time. What's the strategy? Well, there's a lot of, when we're already there, right? So the, the enterprise and, and Google and enterprise and, and cloud platform are in a new relationship. Um, but certainly, you know, the brand that is Google is, is, has a strong affinity with developers. And sometimes when you have that strong affinity, right, the people think, you know, that's all your... On the front end, problem. you guys have that locked yeah, in. Yeah. So the, um, but the reality is when you start talking to enterprises, right, and they're here today, they're not necessarily looking at it and saying, you know, I've got 30,000 cores and these are my applications on it. I want to lift it up and put it over there, right? They call IBM to run their data center. That's what they want. Right. What you know, what's happening is they're seeing that they too are development organizations. So they're not yeah. developers over here, enterprise IT over here. They have strong development organizations, 
that era actually want to invest in the business, create new capability for the enterprise to allow the enterprise to compete. And usually that means that applications, that new applications happening on the cloud doing something very different. Dave Alante and I, I always talk about this because we're old enough to remember the 80s, kind of, you know, stuck in the 80s, hot tub time machine to, to the 80s. And, and back then you had robust development staffs, certainly in financial services, but still yep. today. But then over time, the outsourcing client server brought in the management consultants. Right. Right. And then you had a slow kind of like, you know, really a, a, a gutting of IT. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you had, you know, basically, Drone storage admins doing their job, yeah. Oracle DBAs. There wasn't a lot of love in yeah. IT, yeah. and all of a sudden now an inflection I, point I and a, a shift a is happening at the same time. Yeah. So I have to build out a development organization well, like in, overnight. Do you agree with that trend? And do you see that same somewhat? Dynamic? I mean, it was it landed in the land of package apps, right? <laughs> so you ended up you know here's the guys that run the infrastructure, here's the package apps, and now I think the first wave of that was all of a sudden next thing you know they're moving to software as a service and that provides a compelling alternative to some of the package apps that have been running inside of my enterprise. I think in some ways they didn't realize it, but that was a wake up call that you can build better apps on the cloud, you know, um, with, with really good integration that has better operational performance. So what we're seeing now though is that, and then, the, and then that together with some of the new web scale apps that have been out there, look at what you know, Netflix has done and Drop and other people have done, and so that I think has, in some ways, woken the sleeping giant. Shadow IT, you know, and so yeah. and so, but it has. It's now all of a sudden, but but the imagination is happening. So every enterprise well, and customer, empowerment. They think now I could drive my business and actually not be a cost can, center. And they, well, and, and, and they, they can get a DevOps too, right? Because yeah. just the methodology of building apps, where you used to be spec it, build it, ship it, sit on it. Like your fifteen percent forever and ever and ever. Right. Now it's like ship it, fix it, ship it, update it, yeah. fix it. So we all agree that developers are coming into the enterprise. So the question is, what inning are they in? Are they like bottom of the first inning? Because a lot of we're hearing the same themes over and over again from from practitioners, which is, you know, we want developers in house, and we haven't seen this kind of movement since yeah. the mainframe days, right? Like yeah. in house, but everyone's got in house developers now. Yeah. It seems that's the big trend. Yeah. Well, and you, and you have to like if you. You know, look at it. Look at the FSI vertical, right? Where a lot of technology starts from adoption in FSI, right? And you look at. Um, can you think of any other places where you, where data analytics matters more than than FSI? Whether that's for security, fraud, derivatives processing, all of those are. There's not enough cores in the world to really build that business, and so that they're natural applications. They're data scientists. Their, their lines of business. So before Jeff gets to his question, he wants to ask a question, I want to get your take on the keynote and what's going on here. Analysts and Wall Street analysts in particular like to put things in boxes, but it's really hard to put people into a, in pigeonhole into a corner because you got to talk about integrated stacks. I mean, it'd be nice to put Google in a nice bucket called infrastructure as a service, then you got flat pass. You're seeing kind of the verticalization of these stacks and, and different use cases, so there's no one stack. It is the Lego blocks model. So what's happening in the announcements today? What's really going on with Google Cloud? Is it um, the integration and the mashup of infrastructure service with PaaS, software connected. What is the big theme around? What's yeah. hanging the story? Together? I think a big a big part of it was was you know our realization that the the audience is very nuanced, right? In some cases, somebody's going to come to us for data streaming services, and that's what's going to be the attraction. In other cases, they're going to come to us because I want to run scale out global mobile applications, yeah. and I want to have you know, geo-replication of all my data across the world. In other cases, they come because, you know, the Snapchats that already have built on platforms as a service, others want raw VMs, and then what we said today with Container Engine is that, you know what, we can build that life cycle engine, that manufacturing engine that builds the production line for anybody that's manufacturing software, and depends on that, but it's ridiculous for them to do that on-premise, and as they know, I think it's just the testing resources it takes when you're building a development line. Doing that in the cloud is the natural step, um, instead of them having to figure out how to like manage that with Docker and Kubernetes on premise, here it is. It's running as a managed service, and it's going to be compatible with anything you do on premise. So you guys don't necessarily want to get locked into one use case because there are so many. It's, it's kind of like a Google search. People can type whatever keyword they want to get search result. Yeah, I think that's. I think that that otherwise it's it's too narrow, right? Yeah. I mean, try to. That's back to us. Can say, which I think is kind of comical. 
it's enterprise or it's developer, right? I mean, enterprise, have you ever said that to a real enterprise customer? They would laugh at you, right? Because they just don't, you know, they have I know, the world, the world has to change. Certainly the yeah. venture capital community yeah. wants to put people in buckets. It's like, you know, I'm doing DevOps, I'm doing digital convergence, I'm doing all this stuff. Yeah. It's really a whole new world. Yeah. Well, where do you put self-driving cars, right? <laughs> they're, they're all over the place. But the other thing I just thought was, was interesting, Brian, is, is you talked about user experience being one of the strategic imperatives for 2015. And Google's in a unique position that we talk a lot about the consumerization of IT. Not so, you know, in the context of people's expectations of the way applications behave right. are really driven a lot by your guys' applications as right. much as Facebook and Amazon and some of the other ones. So you, you do have a unique perspective in terms of frontline UI interface interaction with users. Yeah. And then to be able to take that into the enterprise, you know, I don't think most traditional think enterprise that, applications come at it. From no, a user they don't. And we're not where we need to be. We're not where we need to be either on that. So, yeah. but I think it's just sort of like you absolutely take a page out of some of the new designs done by consumer companies. Right. right? I mean, and they get it. And I think that that's you know, you know, as we roll forward, you know, usability is a top goal for us. Right. It doesn't make any sense to build the fastest, craziest service if it's hard to use. And that means thing, you know, infrastructure needs to be. You know, not only just sort of the, the, the time to value has to be short, but you know, the service has to be understandable, you have to be able to monitor it, you have to be able to you know, deploy on it very easily. And so for us, I think that's, um, it's probably a culture change on the infrastructure side of the business, but it's one we're already well along to make. Yeah, it's really interesting. We, uh, we did the N4 show with them, you know, they have a lot of little specialty applications, mm -hmm. and you know, they've got a dedicated team just sure working do. on new watch sure uh, and look and feel because you know they sure kind of figure it out because that's what people expect. That's what yeah, they want. Exactly. Right? They go to the Apple Store. They want to see pretty things. It's true. It's true. And so I think that that's taught us a lot. And that's why I think it, it, I never thought about saying you know consumerization of IT could lend itself to UXD, but I think in this case it's a really good example. Well, your example on the screen is very simple yeah. in terms of with, uh, the atomic. Efficient guys spun up their cores, right? It's right. a very simple UI. Right exactly. There wasn't a lot of choices. Yeah. You had like I think two drop downs and then yeah. it went hit go. Yep. Yeah. And when we, I, mean, I think we redid that and that was part of the showing people what container container engine looks like. And I think we went through like three or four rounds of iteration on that, just saying we understand the technology too well, so sometimes it's hard to put yourself on the other side and say, right. How do I present that out? Right. And so it, that was an iterative process to say, let's make this easier to conceptualize. Yeah, and it was. It was good. Good, it was thank Brian, you. Brian, so talk thank about you. your role. You're new to Google. What's your objective? You're getting your feet wet. I mean, what's it like in the Googleplex? Um, <laughs> the, obviously, you have experience with these guys working with them um, in other capacities, and certainly at Red Hat. But now that you're on the other side, um, What's it like? Tell us. Yeah, it's, what's, it's uh, been a blast. On? You know, I mean, it's it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a life change being by coastal for now until we uh, finish the move out to the west coast, um, and then um, thinking about Palo Alto. Um, yeah, Palo Alto, <laughs> South Coast kind of area, somewhere close to work. Palo Alto you know? is very expensive. Yeah, that's you know? what I hear. That's what I hear. Um, the um, but yeah, it's been fun. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, I think Google's always been a you know, you know public company but a lot of how they do things like the, the, I mean if you saw the, the the video inside the data centers say during the keynote I mean I was as riveted to that as anybody was right and I worked there but it's a geek factor it's just one. crazy and so there's there's that much going on in every corner of the company from a technology perspective, so I'd have to what say that. What sold you on coming over? Did you have to What's take a test? Me? By the way, did you do the? I didn't have to take a test. <laughs> no. I did. <laughs> thank God I didn't. Have to, thank God I didn't have to take the test. There's a GPA. This is the yeah. kind of stuff we want to know on the cube. Kind yeah, of personal yeah. questions. Yeah. The. You know, um, did you take the free lunch? Did you? you know, I. I you know. No, I, we didn't. We didn't spend a lot of time <laughs> on Google headquarters. Even you know, we kind of. But what sold you? I what mean, sold me was you had to yeah. make the whole Google's attractive. They got. Was it yep. a clean sheet of paper? Was it the personnel? Was it yeah, the overall was, chart? It was, it was all of that. It was just the, you know, I, look, I looked at it and said, I looked at it and I said, you know, what's the next chat? I always look at, the break down, you know, things in five and 10 years. I just said, the next five or 10 years, when I look back on that, now what do I want to do tomorrow? When I look back on that, when am I glad that I made that decision? And so I decided it was that I really believe this is the next wave to bring about massive change, both for consumers and enterprises. And instead of watching it from afar, why not participate? So when I had the opportunity to actually participate in a in a in a in a big way, um, yeah, I jumped on it. It was a pretty yeah. short conversation. Kubernetes means helmsman of the ship. Just, you know, as they say, if you don't want to hit icebergs, don't sail in the North Atlantic. 
So good luck with um, uh, your new opportunity. Certainly, thanks for having us here on theCUBE. Brian, here inside theCUBE Live at the Google Developer Conference, the Cloud Platform Live here in San Francisco where all the actions happen with developers. This is theCUBE. I'm John Furrier with Jeff Frick. We'll be right back after this short break.